Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello and welcome. I am Perry Acri, Visiting Scientific Specialist in Emerging Contaminants at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Meskutin, Odawa, Sauk, Miskaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available for viewing online in about a week. I'll be sending an email out to everyone who registered for the webinar once, the, once they are available. Everyone will remain muted for the entire webinar. You can type your questions at any time through the Zoom Q&A feature. You will be able to upvote questions you like within Zoom Q&A using the thumbs up button under the question. I'll be reading the questions to the speaker at the end of the webinar. At that time, the most popular questions will be asked first followed by questions in the order in which they were received. If you have technical difficulties, please send me a private chat message. Also, if you need proof of attendance, please send me a direct chat. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Masood Jahandar Lashaki. Dr. Lashaki is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geomatics Engineering at Florida Atlantic University. He holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science degrees in Chemical Engineering from the University of Tehran and Sharif University of Technology, respectively, obtained a PhD in Environmental Engineering from the University of Alberta, and completed a two-year postdoc fellowship in Chemistry at the University of Ottawa. During his PhD studies, he worked with Ford Motor Company to develop novel adsorbent materials and methods for controlling volatile organic compound emissions from car painting operations. During postdoc fellowship, during his postdoctoral fellowship, he enriched his experience in materials and interfacial chemistry, particularly the development of adsorbent materials for CO2 capture. Before FAU, he worked as a research engineer at Svante, a Canadian clean tech company with a revolutionary CO2 capture technology to continue his inquiry into the stability and performance of adsorbent materials for use in pilot scale CO2 capture projects sponsored by Husky and Lafarge Holcim. At FAU, he has continued the development of adsorbent materials for different CO2 capture applications. Since 2011, he authored over 65 journal articles and conference contributions in renowned venues. Dr. Jahandar Lashaki is currently serving on the early career editorial boards of the Journal of Hazardous Materials and the Journal of Environmental Engineering. The floor is yours, Dr. Lashaki. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about our research on adsorption-based CO2 capture applications. Uh, you can see uh, we are on uh, CETE campus uh, in Dania Beach, one of the six campuses of Florida Atlantic University in South Florida. And with that, I will go over uh, why we need to capture CO2. Uh, CO2 capture has attracted tremendous attention over the past couple of decades, particularly the past few years. And uh, the reason behind it is uh, as you can see on the left side, uh, starting in late 1950s, uh, we have a facility in uh, Mauna Loa, uh, and in, we measure CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. So the concentration is going up continuously, and as we speak, uh, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is around 420 parts per million. Now, over the same period, 1960 to now, you can see what happened with uh, atmospheric temperatures. They are going up, so there's a correlation between the concentration of CO2 going up in the atmosphere and the temperature going up in the atmosphere, particularly when we compare it to the late 1800s, early 1900s, you can see the temperature is around 1.2 degrees C above that number. So in order to control this, uh, 
we need to capture CO2. Currently, uh, we have uh, a commercialized technology for capturing CO2. It has been around uh, since 1930. It's around over 90 years old. And this uh, CO2 capture technology is called amine scrubbing. Uh, in this technology, uh, what we do is we have an amine solution coming from the top part, and then the CO2 rich gas will come from the bottom. And as, a con as we have contact between the two, we have CO2 removed. So the gas that is coming out here is free of CO2. Then what we do is the amine solution that now contains CO2 will be sent through the stripper where we heat up uh, this mixture of amines and CO2. The amine solution goes down, CO2 is removed from it, and the CO2 goes up to be condensed and recovered on top. This amine solution that is now regenerated, uh, no CO2 will be recycled back to the top part of the adsorption column. So this is the process that we currently have. We use it for uh, primarily for natural gas purification to remove CO2 and hydrogen sulfide from it. But this suffers from a number of shortcomings. Number one, the energy demand to regenerate the amine is very high. 30% monoethanol amine, the remainder is water and water is very hard to heat up. So we need a lot of energy to heat up water. So the energy demand is very high. Whenever we have liquids, we have leaking. We have foaming issues. We have corrosion issues in this problem. We have amine deactivation, particularly if we have things like oxygen or sulfur oxides in the gas. They attack amine, they degrade them. So over time, we need to add more and more amine uh, to compensate for the performance loss. Now, how to address such issues? So that is the focus of our research here, you know, we have a technology well developed, a number of shortcomings, how we can fix it. The idea that we have here to fix this issue is called amine modified materials. So we know amines are good because they have high affinity to capture CO2. However, they have limitations. What we do is we have hybrid materials where we have a porous support, typically microporous or mesoporous. It could be silica, it could be metal organic frameworks, it could be carbons. There are different materials out there as a porous support. And then we put the amine onto this solid support. We immobilize the amine because now the amine is no longer liquid, so it cannot leak. It cannot cause corrosion or foaming issues. And there is no water involved, so the energy demand would be reduced. So that is the idea that we are trying to work on here. Put the amine on a solid, immobilize it to fix the problems I discussed earlier. What type of amines we can use? There are two general ways to make these amine modified materials. The first one is called impregnation, which is simple mixing. We have a solid, we have the amine, we mix them, amine goes into the pores of the solid, and then we use it for CO2 capture. There are a bunch of uh, amines commonly used. One of them is called polyethylene amine, the branched one. And you can see this is a polyamine. Uh, it has a bunch of primary amines, as you can see here. It has a bunch of secondary amines, and then it has a bunch of tertiary amines. And typically the primary amines and the secondary amines are primarily responsible for capturing CO2. Tertiary amines do not have much affinity or willingness to capture CO2. Other ones, we have linear PIs, you know, we have a bunch of secondary amines that can capture CO2. And then we also have polyolidamine, uh, a bunch of, uh, you can see, primary amines uh, next to each other. These chemicals are commercially available, and these are the ones that are typically used by people in the field. Now, another way to uh, functionalize silica or carbon or MOF with amine is called grafting. This is not simple mixing, this is bonding, typically covalent bonding between the amine and the support we are talking about. So for example, in case of silica, we have a bunch of hydroxyl groups on silica. And then when we add the amine, which are typically called aminosilanes because we have, they have a silane group here and we have an amine group here, 
then three hydroxy groups will react with three alkoxy groups on the amine, covalently bonding, and then we can use this material for CO2 capture. There are different amino silens that we can use containing primary amine, secondary amine, secondary and primary amine, or two secondary amines and one primary amine. All of them are commercially available in the market and we typically use them. Now, once we have this material, the idea is we do cycling. So we do adsorption to capture CO2, and then we do regeneration to release the CO2. And this is the idea here. We have a CO2-rich feed gas, examples of which I will talk about later today. The CO2-rich feed gas will go in. The material we made, we put it here. The gas goes in. CO2 will be removed, and the gas that comes out is free of CO2. This is like a filter, the water filters that we use at home to remove contaminants from drinking water. Same idea, we have a filter here, the focus is removing CO2 from the gas phase. At some point, the filter is saturated, can no longer capture CO2. At home, with the water filters, we just dispose them, replace it with a new one. Here, the idea is we should be able to reuse the filter for which we send it to the regeneration step, we heat up at high temperatures, we expose them to either steam, nitrogen, air, or CO2, we send these gases in, and CO2 will come out, released by the material. Now the material is like day one, we can send it back to the adsorption to do another cycle. And we go back and forth between them. So it's not a one-time use filter, this is potentially hundreds or thousands of times back to back of consecutive cycles. Now, go back to the material about grafting and impregnation. There are pros, pros and cons associated with each material uh, development technique here. Typically with impregnation, we can load an, a huge amount of amine into the support. So we call amine loading how much amine we put and typically impregnation can have a lot more amine loaded into the material compared to graft. Now, I typically describe these amines as cars. If you have more cars in a city, you can move around more people. So more amine typically results in more CO2 capture. However, if you have too many cars on the streets, we have traffic congestion. Nobody is getting to the destination in a timely manner. So tr the, the transportation will slow down. In our context, we call it kinetics, how fast we can capture CO2. In transportation, we say how, how fast we can get people to their destination. Since we have too much amine in impregnation case, grafting is typically faster. Although impregnation can capture more CO2, the capture is faster on the grafting side. The other thing that we need to talk about is amine loss, because in the first place, we talked about these things because we had amine loss in the amine scrubbing process. Impregnation is typically not good for this purpose, because in impregnation, we simply mix the amine with the solid. Nothing is really keeping the amine in place. So this is not really good, while grafting is good because it's covalently bonded to the surface. And it's very hard to move around these amines or evaporate them. That's a good point about grafting uh, method. The other one is leaching. Typically, leaching means a liquid coming out of a solid. Impregnation suffers from leaching because, again, nothing is really keeping the amine in place. If we expose the material to steam, it will leach out. The amine will leach out. If you expose it to water vapor, the amine may come out. So that is the problem. And grafting is also good for that purpose. The other consideration here is the stability. Stability means performance. How many times we can reuse and reuse this filter. That depends on many different factors, which I will briefly talk about, including what is the amine type? What is the feed gas? Like what gases do you have in the feed gas? Can some of them probably cause any issues? 
regeneration conditions, like what temperature you use, what gas do you use? These are all important considerations. So there is no single answer here. You see about these questions, very easy to answer. But the last one is a tricky one. That's why back in 2019, right before joining my current institution, uh, I did uh, a review paper published in Chemical Society Reviews. And uh, at the time, we looked at 600 references, 600 plus references in the literature to come up with ideas about what factors affect the stability of these materials. Increase it, decrease it, what is the situation and what are some suggestions to fix it? So we generally found that this is a multifaceted puzzle. This is not a single size fits all, no single solution here. You really need to go case by case and there are two things primarily affecting this. Number one is the feed gas composition. What do you have in the feed gas? Typically, if it comes from flue gas, like we burn something and now we want to capture CO2 from the resulting gas, oxygen is an issue because we always use excess air and not all the oxygen is used and oxygen can be an issue. The other thing is if we use coal, Sulfur oxides could be an issue. If we use natural gas, nitrogen oxides could be an issue. And some of them are well known to kill amines. So these are some of the considerations we need to be careful about. How about water vapor? Typically, all these gases that we use, they have some water vapor in them. On the other hand, we are talking about regeneration conditions, how we regenerate them how high the temperature is. Is it 100 degrees C? It is 150 degrees C. That is very important. What type of purge gas we use? Do we use a steam? Do we use nitrogen? Do we use air? Particularly oxygen can uh, be very tricky. Do we use CO2 to purge CO2? So uh, we looked at all these things. And as I mentioned, they are all summarized in this review paper, which kind of formed my current research because after looking at all this literature, we identified some of the gaps in the literature. And now we are going back to the literature and we try to bridge the gap by doing some studies that I will talk about later today. Now, just an example of how this stability and feed gas composition plays out in flue gas. And in this case, flue gas is again, the gas coming out of a combustion chamber. Flue gas, an example of it is the gas coming out of the tailpipe of the car, uh, coming out of power plants when we burn coal, natural gas. These are all called flue gas. So you can see typically we use excess air and we always have some oxygen. Oxygen is an issue because the gas is hot. Typically you are looking at 50 to 80 degrees C in terms of temperature. If you have a lot of oxygen, oxygen can oxidize your amines. That's one consideration. The other thing is these gases are typically saturated with water vapor. So if your material suffers from stability, low stability in water vapor, that is another consideration. If you are dealing with coal combustion, then you can definitely should be concerned. You should definitely be concerned about SOx, you know, SO2, sulfur dioxide, because that can kill our amines, many amines in no time. So we need to be very careful about that. And the other one is NOx, nitrogen oxides uh, in the flue gas. Some of them, depending on their nature, they can also do damage. So that was the primary subject of my research prior to joining my current institution. Particularly when I was working at this company, Savante, they have a proprietary technology for CO2 capture. They are now doing large scale, relatively large scale with some oil and gas companies, with cement producers uh, to capture CO2 from uh, many different uh, gas streams. So what they do is the first step is they send in the flue gas and the CO2 is captured, then they purge it and this rotates around and goes rounds and rounds and it will be exposed to different cycles and different things. And then in this case, they do steam for regeneration because typically if you are looking at a power plant, we always have some steam, low heat steam, 
no other use because it is an exhausted steam, we call it. And it's a good opportunity to use that as the source of heat rather than creating something and uh, you know using energy to create something, some source of heat. So uh, that is what they do. And the reason they do it is the other purge gases do not make as much sense, either economically or operationally. For example, if we use nitrogen, that doesn't make, make, make much sense because how do you want to get nitrogen? It's very expensive to produce nitrogen. Number two, the point about CO2 capture is to recover pure CO2. If you want to purge it with nitrogen, you are diluting it back. So that will defy the, the purpose kind of thing. It is against the purpose you have in the first place to recover pure CO2, to store it, to utilize it, or to do something with it. So nitrogen is out of question. Some people said, let's purge CO2 with CO2. But then sometimes we have deactivation issues because uh, CO2 can deactivate amines at high temperatures to produce some urea. That's a problem. It kills our amine, not favorable. Some people said, let's use air because if you are in, in the middle of nowhere, you want to do CO2 capture, your best option is air. You know, uh, it's always available and we can use it. But the problem is air has 21% oxygen and it's very oxidizing in nature. So we should be very careful about oxidative degradation because oxygen may kill our amine in no time. And then we need to replace our material, which is very costly. So that's how this company came up with the idea of using the steam because you send in a steam and then you purge the CO2. When it comes out here, you have a steam and CO2. Now, if you condense the steam, you recover pure CO2 and then you can store it, uh, you can utilize it. So that was the idea here behind the steam. Prior to joining my current institution, we did a number of studies on you know, using steam and how our materials will perform in steam. I'm providing some sample publications here. This is back to in 2017. There is another one from 2017 that we discussed and we published in Chemical Engineering Journal. And more recently, you know, we are still working on some old data that we have, adding, you know, new results and publishing. And this was published recently, this past summer, uh, you know, we also published part of the work dealing with flue gas and how we can make sure that we develop things that are stable in a steam and a steam does not compromise the performance of the material. This was a you know, brief history of you know, what I did mostly prior to joining my current institution. But then the idea was, uh, you know, I, I did that review paper. I tried to you know, uh, find gaps in the literature where other researchers did not look into. And now we try to bridge the gap to help the community have better understanding of how things work uh, with respect to different applications involving these materials. Going forward from now in this talk, I want to talk about three projects. And these are the projects that I have done and I'm still involved in here at Florida Atlantic University, my current institution. The first one is a project called Renewable Natural Gas. Natural gas is widely used. Natural gas in the common sense, it's a fossil fuel, but many people may not know that we can do renewable natural gas, not the conventional one, which is fossil fuel, renewable one. This is the idea that we have here. Some background information. There are two major ways to get renewable natural gas. One of them deals with the trash we produce at home called municipal solid waste. This is the trash we produce at home. And in 2018, according to Environmental Protection Agency, in the United States, we produced 292 million tons of municipal solid waste. That means each of us produced 4.9 pounds per day average in the United States. Out of this 292, one third of it was organic. It means it was either food waste or yard trimmings. By organic, we mean something that can degrade rapidly. If this is the trash that if you keep at home for too long, you will see that it degrades, produce very bad odor issues, 
you also have some liquid uh, coming out and it will cause a lot of problems. That's because they readily degrade uh, within days. Out of the 292, half of the trash in the US goes to landfills, not recycled. We do not do, you know, uh, sustainable things with it. You know, we do not dispose it and manage this waste in a sustainable manner. We send it to landfills, which is probably the worst type of waste disposal. 50% of the waste in US goes to landfills. And that is this chunk. And we haven't really made much progress over the past three decades, you know. We sent half of our waste to landfills in the US. Out of the portion going to landfills, 31% is organics. Food waste, yard trimmings, goes to landfills. 31%, 46 million tons. Now, let's see what happens when we dispose them in landfills. Two major issues. Number one, something called leachate. Another term that we refer to this is garbage juice. This is when you keep the trash in home for a couple of days or more, it will release some liquid. That is leachate or garbage juice. That's a big problem. The same thing happens in landfill. When we dump the waste into the landfill, that's a common problem. That's why landfills have a liner to prevent this leachate to contaminate our groundwater. The second problem is called landfill gas or LFG, landfill gas. And this is the gas that comes out here. Trash is degrading. We do not have oxygen in the landfill. So it's anaerobic decomposition in the absence of oxygen. And it typically produces a mix of methane, CO2, hydrogen sulfide, water vapor, and a bunch of other gases. Now, methane is natural gas. Has huge advantage to produce energy. However, on the other hand, methane is a potent greenhouse gas. So if you release this to the atmosphere, we are in big trouble because when you compare methane to CO2, methane is 30 times worse than CO2 in terms of global warming. So we should not release this methane to the atmosphere. We should recover it. What to do with it? Methane is natural gas. Let's make some money or let's produce some energy out of it. That's why in the United States, we have 538 operational landfill energy projects. Where I live in Florida, we have 19 currently operating, producing energy. We have another 13 candidate landfills in Florida where there is potential to produce energy. In Illinois, where UIUC is located, you can see there are 16 operational projects and there is potential to do another 26. Methane, why release it to the atmosphere? Let's recover it and produce some energy out of it, produce power and things like that. This is about landfill gas. And this is renewable uh, gas because as long as we produce trash, we will get landfill gas. So it is renewable. It is not coming from the fossil fuel that should be down there for millions of years. No, this is something that as long as it's renewable, as long as we produce trash, there will be landfill gas produced. Now, another idea about production of methane and renewable natural gas is called biogas production. This happens primarily on farms. So we have livestock waste, we have crops, we have food waste, we have wastewater. And typically if you go to farms, to wastewater treatment plants, it smells very bad because typically if the waste disposal is not up to the standards, we have this decomposition going on, producing greenhouse gases, producing hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten egg smell, causing all sorts of problems. The better way is let's manage this waste uh, disposal in a more uh, controlled manner. Let's put all of them in something called anaerobic digester. Instead of just leaving them on the farm to decay and produce all sorts of troubles, let's take control and do this in a controlled manner. Now, if we do this, if we have these big enclosures and we keep them under anaerobic condition, it means no oxygen. Now, what happens is we get two products. The gas phase is called biogas, which is again, methane, 
CO2, hydrogen sulfide, water vapor, primarily. There are other gases, but these are the main ones. The solid phase is called digestate, which is a form of fertilizer. We can amend agricultural soil with it. So we can send it back to the farm, use it as a fertilizer, so we do not end up using more synthetic fertilizers that are produced in factories. So this is a natural thing. Let's return it to the earth and uh, you know, cut down the fertilizer use. Now, biogas is produced. It's partially methane. What we typically do currently is let's do cogeneration of heat and electricity on the farm. Let's burn this methane, produce some heat, produce steam, produce power to run agricultural activities on farm. But that is not the best way to use this biogas because if we purify it, it means remove these three guys and only focus on methane, purify it. Then we can get biomethane, which is called renewable natural gas. It is renewable because as long as we have these things, we can produce this. It's renewable. It's not fossil fuel. Now, once we purify it, what happens is we can put it into the gas grid, sell it to people, industries, or we can use it in cars as a carbon neutral fuel. Not very common in the US, but there are many countries around the world where cars run on CNG, compressed natural gas. We have hundreds of thousands of them in countries like India, where people run the car, not on gasoline, on compressed natural gas. So we can use this as a fuel in transportation. Now, where this connects to the LFG, to the landfill gas, is these two have similar composition. These are biogas, and this is landfill gas. All of them contain a high portion of methane. They both contain a lot of CO2. They are both saturated with water vapor, and they have different levels of hydrogen sulfide in them. These are the four main ones that we are focusing on. Now, the composition is the same. So if we want to purify them, there should be a common way that works for both, probably. Now, we want to do purification. There are different techniques currently. People do industry do purification. But there's a major problem with that. When we talk about four compounds and we only want to recover methane and remove the other three, in the current situation, we do one at a time. So we get rid of hydrogen sulfide, then we remove water vapor, then we remove carbon dioxide, whatever left is biomethane or RNG. This is not the best way to do it because now we have three different processes. Each of them can go down and cause problems. Why not do all at once simultaneously? So four things go in, only methane comes out of the other way. The other three are filtered. That is the idea and that is our objective. Why not do all three captures, uh, CO2, water vapor, hydrogen sulfide at the same time? The proposed solution that we have, and this was part of, a, this is part of an ongoing investigation funded by U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, is we can send biogas or landfill gas to a bed containing our adsorbent materials, and then only methane comes out. The other four are captured. At some point, the material is saturated. We send it to the desorption step. We purge it at high temperature. All these things come out. The adsorbent is now clean. We send it back for another cycle. The question is, what this adsorbent should be? You know, like what should be the nature? Do we have a checklist of qualifications to make sure that the adsorbent we have works for this purpose? This is where we propose our material, which is called amino silica. It's amine-modified mesoporous silica. We have an amine on a mesoporous silica, and the way we make it is we have the silica, we hydrate it, we have that uh, hydroxyl groups, and then they react with the alkoxy groups to give us amino silica. 
which is covalently bonded to the silica, so very stable. Now, we asked ourselves a number of questions. Number one, methane should not be filtered. And this, based on our results that I will share with you shortly, methane is not filtered. Methane goes in, comes out. We want the other three removed. And our material can does the job. It can do the job. All three removed, same time. Once removed, we want to reverse it because we want to reuse the filter. And the optic was reversible. This reversing, which is called desorption or regeneration, happens at high temperature. So the material should be thermally stable. Our material was thermally stable. And if you are in the middle of nowhere doing this, you don't want to deal with steam or nitrogen or things like that. You want a very simple available purge gas like air. And the material was stable in hot air. Our best material was actually, we tested it 100 consecutive times, adsorption, desorption, adsorption, desorption. No loss of performance, 100 cycles. And it happened in nitrogen, even if we used air, stable performance, no loss. So you have a filter that can be used over and over again under two different scenarios, nitrogen or air. And this will give us great flexibility, particularly if you want to cut down the process cost because uh, you, do, you don't pay for air. Air is available everywhere, while nitrogen should be produced and it's very costly. So then we put this material in something called the column breakthrough test. We wanted to see how it works in real life. We sandwiched our material in this experimental setup and then we exposed it in different things. For example, CO2, dry CO2, humid CO2, CO2 humidified mixed with hydrogen sulfide to do the test. We did all these combinations to mimic biogas and lanthanide gas. And what we got was, first we tested one at a time. We exposed our material to water vapor. In this period of time, no water vapor is coming out, 100% filtered. So it worked for water vapor. Then we did CO2 and water vapor. CO2 did not come out for a period of time. Hydrogen sulfide alone did not come out filtered. And then we put all three of them together. None of them came out for, the, for some period of time at the beginning. So the filter can remove all three simultaneously, which was the objective we had in the first place. This is project two, still ongoing. I have a few uh, graduate students, masters and PhD working on this. Project three is another project we are currently investigating. This time we are dealing with air revitalization in enclosed spaces. Uh, as a teacher, I hate when I talk about keywords without defining them because I want my audience to have clear understanding of what I talk about. So I want to define what is air revitalization and what is enclosed space. So let's look at that. And this is already published in Chemical Engineering Journal by one of my master's students. Enclosed environments are international space station, spacecraft, submarine, lunar habitats. We have a number of people working, living in this environment, in this enclosure. And, but this environment is, does not have access to open atmosphere. Okay, so the air quality could be very bad in this environment. We should make sure that people are safe and the air quality is good. So these are enclosed environments. We have lack of ventilation in the common sense, and we should be very careful about these astronauts or submarine crew. Air revitalization is, there are people in these enclosures living, inhaling, they take in CO2, uh, oxygen, and then they release CO2. This is not our bedroom or our house or our university campus where we have ventilation and we have access to the open atmosphere. In these cases, the CO2 will accumulate in the environment. So over time, CO2 goes up, up, up as people live, breathe, and release CO2. 
at some point, CO2 becomes too high and people living or working in these environments will experience health impacts, symptoms of headache, uh, losing focus uh, at some point, you know, drowsiness, you know, confusion, all these things. And if it is too high, it will affect the performance of their internal organs, shortness of breath, the heart is not working probably uh, properly, blood pressure is, is affected now. So CO2 should be removed because we want to protect these people. NASA currently use this by something called uh, CEDRA, Carbon Dioxide Removal Assembly, CDRA. And this is the process they use. They have two sets of beds to do this. And then this is number one, and this is number two. At each time, one of them is doing adsorption, the other one is doing desorption, and then we switch between them, you know, we go back and forth between them. And each of these sets have two beds. Like first we remove water vapor, which is called desiccant to dry the gas. And then we remove the CO2 in the second one. Same story for the other uh, set of beds. Now, there are a number of shortcomings here with this process that we looked at to see whether we can fix. Number one, the material used by NASA, the incumbent material is called Zeolite 5A, commercially available in the market versus our material amino silica. And we looked at different parameters here. Number one, NASA's material cannot remove CO2 and water vapor at the same time. That's why they have two beds back to back in series. Our material, we showed, we can't do it in one step. In terms of optics, they both showed similar optics, but our material had faster optics. And I will go through some of these results shortly. At the beginning of the process, we need to activate our material. We purge it, we heat it up to make sure that the material is clean, and then we use it. And that temperature in our case was lower. So less energy used to clean the material. Once we capture the CO2, we need to regenerate it to use it again and again. So our material could be also regenerated at a lower temperature. Thermal stability, both materials were thermally stable and they also kept their performance over many cycles. Now, this is a summary. These are the results, for example, in terms of activation. NASA's material needs probably 150 or higher to 300 C for activation. Our material needs probably somewhere between 70 and 120 C, much lower. In terms of kinetics, how fast adsorption happens, at the end, they are similar. But when you look at the initial part, our material was faster in capture compared to their material. When we regenerated the material, they needed at least 200 degrees C to achieve 100% removal. We could achieve that somewhere between 90 and 120. And when we did cycles, both kept the performance for at least 20 cycles. So you can use this 20 times without losing any performance. And now the last project, project four that we are currently working on. I have uh, one PhD student working on and we recently submitted a paper to Chemical Engineering Journal, which is currently under review. Hopefully we hear back from them soon to get this published. Now, the idea is let's capture CO2 from ambient air. At the very beginning of the talk, I mentioned that CO2 in the atmosphere is going up. The idea is let's extract CO2 from the atmosphere. That's kept, and that's called ambient air uh, CO2 capture or DAC, direct air capture. We call it DAC, DAC. The idea is you can put this material in a reactor. We can send in ambient air, which contains 420 parts per million by volume of CO2. And then what we get at the end is CO2 free air. So CO2 is removed. At some point, it gets saturated. We do the regeneration and then the CO2 is recovered. Again, in all of these cases, the idea is the same, cyclic adsorption, desorption, but the application is totally different. In this case, we went with impregnated materials. 
We did branched polyethylene imine and we did tetraethylene pentamine, both commercially available. You can see on the left how we made the material. You know, it was uh, it, it involved a series of material uh, processing, you know, mixing, heating, drying, all those things to make the materials for testing. We screened our material and we came up with two final material with good performance. One of them was TEPA, which is a relatively small amine. So we were uh, worried about evaporation because this is impregnation. This is a small amine. If we heat it up, maybe we lose amine. Let's look at the performance. The performance was interesting because when we did 50 cycles, up to like 20 something cycles, we didn't see much loss. After that, it went downhill. This, I, was, this was interesting to us that initially the performance was there, we kept it, but then over time, the performance went down in the second half of cycling. So probably if I do another 50 cycle, this guy goes down and at some point we have no capacity left. We looked at the performance cycle by cycle. And interestingly, we saw that TEPA is lost because it's not thermally stable. Each time we heat it up to 100 degrees C to regenerate the material, we lose part of the tepa. When I look at this, it reminds me of some stocks in the stock market. You know, you have lower lows and lower highs, and that's a very bad trend because this stock is going down in price. Here, the same thing. We continuously lose amine. Initially, the material had enough amine to maintain the performance, but at some point, the I mean, was not enough to keep the performance anymore. Somebody is in debt, they, they will tap into the credit line and everything, but at some point, they do not have any more resources, so they will experience some decline in the financial condition. Same story here. The other one, BPI, kept 100% of the performance at least for 50 cycles. So this is something that we want, stable performance in successive cycles. And when we looked at the cycle by cycle performance, just look at this, 22% loss. Look at this, 0.5%, much more stable thermally. So we can use this back to back without worrying about loss of performance. Then we use this experimental setup, we put these materials here, and then we tested them in the presence of some CO2, dry condition, humid condition to see how water vapor will affect the, the performance. And we also had an analyzer at the outlet to measure how much CO2 is coming out. TEPA, the small amine had better performance. So the filter, you did not see any CO2 coming out of the filter, 100% removal for uh, around uh, 12 to 15 minutes. But the other one, BPI, was much shorter. So we still prefer BPI, although it has a shorter cycle time, because it's like a turtle. goes slow, but you can count on it to make it to the finish line. BPI will be with you for hundreds of cycles, it will be much less in terms of performance. However, it, keep, it keeps that performance for a longer time. Then we also looked at BPI in dry and wet conditions in the presence of humidity. And we found that our material gets a boost. So in dry condition, this is the performance. When we make it humid, the performance is improved. And that's great because if you are doing this in a place like Florida, capturing CO2 from the ambient air, I bet you, you have a lot of humidity out there. So humidity not only does not harm us, it actually helps us. Humidity is helpful to improve the performance. And this happens because the chemistry shifts as we go from dry to humid. And I believe, you know, I don't want to get into the chemistry behind it. We have, you know, some good idea about why it happens. But the chemistry shifts from something to something, and that change is in our favor. And we love it because our performance improves in, in, a, in a condition that is relevant to our uh, uh, operational and, and performance conditions. 
So uh, these are these were you know samples of our research projects that I wanted to discuss with you, and uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, my whole research group, uh, my PhD students, some of them are on this call, uh, my master's students, my undergrad students. Uh, this was not possible without their contribution and fantastic performance. I would like to acknowledge uh, financial support by U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Janke Foundation, and also U.S. Department of Defense for financially supporting uh, our activities. You can see my contact information. Uh, I will be here to, and I would be happy to answer questions. And if uh, we couldn't answer some questions, uh, you can always reach out to me uh, by email. I would be happy to get back to you. And with this, I will uh, uh, send the podium back to our moderator, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Excellent talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Lashaki. Um, I just want to remind everyone really quickly that if you do have a question that you would like asked, please post it in the Q&A chat, and I will read them aloud. And uh, we already have a couple of questions, so I'm going to start with those. Um, first question, with adsorption regeneration, what is the general efficiency of the cycle? How much of the gases steam coming out is still CO2? So that's a great question. So that is typically one of the parameters that we control. So that's why, for example, if we go back, consider you know, a condition like this, this is very close to real life application of it. So we do this cycling, and as soon as we get here, where CO2 starts to come out, we stop the process. So if you stop it exactly here, almost no CO2 is coming out. We send our filter for regeneration, and then we do this cycle again, and hopefully we do not lose any performance. So it is up to us when stop the process. But we typically do it here, and that is called breakthrough time. That is when the gas is breaking through the bed, and we want to stop it right there to prevent any CO2 coming out. Does that answer the question? I think so. If okay. if the person, whoever asked that question, if it doesn't answer your question, just ask another one. <laughs> um, okay, next question. Um, you said that the other 70% of the cycle fluid is water, which is hard to heat up in the stripper. Are there alternatives or is it a question of stability, loss, and cost slash economics? That's a great question. I believe you are talking about the, uh, one of the very first slides I talked about. That is the commercial uh, process. What we do here is not that. We, we use that as baseline. We know there is a problem because 70% is water and 30% is amine. And when you are heating this up to remove the CO2, you are also heating up 70% water, which is not good. So that's why we do this technique that we mentioned instead of absorption that that technique does with a B, we do adsorption with a D, which means instead of a liquid, we are using a solid. And then there is no 70% water in the process. It's a solid with some, uh, with some amine, but there is no water involved. Unless we have water in the gas stream we are trying to treat. Okay, excellent. Couple more questions popping up. I have a question about uh, compressed natural CNG gas. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to generate from biomethane, Professor? Yes, or it is possible. So compressed natural gas is natural gas from any source. It could be fossil fuel. It could be from landfill gas. It could be from uh, biogas. And then we compress it by applying pressure. The problem is, uh, or the, you know, the concern is we cannot make CNG out of landfill gas or biogas without purification because then those impurities will make our life very hard. For example, landfill gas, biogas, they have hydrogen sulfide. It smells very bad. This is the rotten egg smell, and it is very corrosive and flammable. 
so we, you do not want this in your methane. So we need to remove it. So once you make pure natural gas out of fossil fuel or landfill gas or biogas, it's just a matter of compressing it. And that compress, com compressing of the gas can be done on any source of natural gas, whether it is from landfill gas, biogas, or fossil fuel. It should be pure. That is the only thing. No water, no CO2, no hydrogen sulfide. Uh, these are the considerations. Excellent. <clears throat> Couple more questions. Um, what do you do with a H2S contaminated CO2 stream if all removed at the same time? Uh, could you please repeat the question, sir? What do you do with a H2S contaminated CO2 stream if it was all removed at the same time? Okay, that's a great question. So uh, hydrogen sulfide, there is one idea here that uh, we, we, we are going to look in, into the future. And that idea is CO2, hydrogen sulfide, what to do with that gas. There is an idea that you know once you get that gas, you can uh, send it into a biofilter with some special type of algae. And this algae is going to use CO2 and hydrogen sulfide as their source of food. So they use it to grow. So that is one idea here that we can use, you know, like uh, CO2, hydrogen sulfide, feed it into the algae in order to, uh, uh, you know, take care of them and, and utilize them. Okay. Would, <clears throat> would the use of amino silica strategies be considered low cost or an expensive strategy? What are the comparisons? That's a great question. The problem with this technique is it is still developing. So the other technique that I talked about has been around since 1930. What we are talking about is at maximum, it's like 20 years old. And most of the development happened over the past decade or so. So this is a case like I, 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 I want to uh, compare this maybe to solar panels. Five, 10, two years ago, solar panels were very expensive, but the cost is going down rapidly. So what happens is you have this mature technology that has probably stable cost, and then you have this developing that is higher cost now, but is going down sharply. And the hope is at some point, you will be below this. So let me provide some numbers to you. You know, several years ago, we were talking about hundreds of dollars to capture a ton of CO2. Now there are companies out there claiming to do it with around $30. And that number is dropping because they are making it more efficient. They are looking into different innovations to make it commercially work. And that's why there are some big oil and gas companies into this. Occidental is putting money here. Uh, ExxonMobil is putting money. Husky is putting money uh, into the CO2 capture and sequestration or other things. The other idea is currently CO2 has no value. We should give value to CO2. That is when uh, things like enhanced oil recovery are coming into the picture where you can use the CO2 to produce more oil. You can use the CO2 as a feedstock to produce something that can be sold and you make money because then you say, okay, it cost me $50 to capture it, but then I have a source of income to compensate that. So these are all great questions, but they are part of a moving puzzle that uh, still, you know, we have, uh, there are thousands of people and companies around the world working on these problems as we are speaking here. Okay, uh, I think we, we still have a little bit of time. I think I could fit in at least one more question here. Um, what is the crucial factor that affects, sorry for the noise in the background. Uh, what is the crucial factor that affects the performance TEPA and the other adsorbent TEPA compared mm -hmm. to, uh, they said they can't recall the name. Um, so hopefully you know what they're talking about. But uh, it says, is it absorbent size, surface area, initial adsorbates con con concentration, uh, or adsorption temperature, ETC? That's a great question. So let me go back here and show it what, what's the difference. So uh, here I talked about TEPA having better performance. You know, you see the, the blue one is TEPA, and it's 
adsorbing more CO2 for a longer time compared to BPEI. The reason is when we go back to the structure, TEPA has primary and secondary amines. All of them capture CO2. While in BPEI, the other one, these guys, tertiary amines, do not capture CO2. So you have amines that part of it is, you know, con uh, you know, contributing to capture, while in the other one, all of them capture. So that's why TEPA has better capacity and higher uptake. The problem is this is a very volatile amine. It has low boiling point. So when you heat it at 100 degrees C, each cycle, you lose part of it, while this one is much larger with higher boiling point, and you do not lose much of it. So that's why here you see when you do 50 cycles, you lose a big chunk of TEPA. It's volatile. It comes off, while BPI, you don't lose much of it. So it is part of the better performance of TEPA is the structure. It has better amines for CO2 capture. But overall, TEPA is not a good molecule long-term, st stability-wise. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, uh, that's that's it's one o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and end it here. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Lashaki for an amazing talk, and uh, all of the rest of you for joining us today. And have a great week. Thank you very much.